Chicago, a booming city in the 1970s. They have built the world's tallest structure in 73 with the Sears Tower, now known as the Willis Tower today, but the city didn't really have much for thrills. By that, I mean they don't really have any amusement parks or rides anywhere. Besides like Navy Pier, they have some attractions, but they haven't seen an amusement park in over 15 years. So I wanna look at a park that Chicago has built. It was one of the world's first kind of amusement parks. It had a revolutionary roller coaster in its time and will be a big tribute to many short childhoods of many people in Chicago that still remember this place today and is one of the most infamous places that have ever been created and is very forgotten to many. So what happened to this park? So let's go back to 1975 to a place called Old Chicago. Looking for a break? Wanna get away from it all? Then come scream your troubles away at Old Chicago, the world's only full-sized indoor amusement park. Come date night, date night, date night, this Friday night. Your date gets to ride the rides absolutely free. You can even bump yourself blue in the Disco Bash Friday and Saturday nights. Talk about a good time, then talk about it at Old Chicago. Old Chicago. The story of Old Chicago begins back in the early 1970s. A man by the name of Robert Brindle was a real estate developer who was born in California, who was raised in Chicago, and was known to build shopping centers. Until one weekend, he decided to take his family on a trip to Knott's Berry Farm and Disneyland, where he had an epiphany. That was to build an amusement park in Chicago. Chicago hasn't seen a park since Riverview back in the 1960s. But Chicago is known for their very harsh winters, so he wanted a park that could withstand the cold and all the snow. By that, he had the idea of the world's first indoor amusement park. And that's how the idea of Old Chicago was born. Old Chicago was meant to be a shopping mall and an indoor amusement park that existed in the southwest Chicago suburb of Boiling Brook, Illinois. It was meant to be open in 1975. It was billed as the world's first indoor amusement park. It was intended to draw visitors all year round, rain or shine, and to be a great fanfare of over 15,000 visitors on June 17th, 1975. The mall had a square layout. Within the center was a heart of Old Chicago, the amusement park that had a massive sun dome just towering over it. They had many attractions like three roller coasters, a ferris wheel, and many other rides I'll get into later, as well as a shopping center that was themed to the turn of the century, and a design that was reminiscent of the architecture of Louis Sullivan, and to give a feel of the 1893 World Columbian Fair in Chicago. However, a few months after opening, the complex would run into financial troubles and could soon potentially fall suit of bankruptcy right before even opening. This project took over two years of construction and had a budget of $20 million. But because it took longer than expected to build this place, they went over budget, so they were now in debt. But even with this, the park was still open and would have a very memorable marketing campaign. The opening would have a TV commercial that had an 18-year-old Michelle Moth tap dancing on top of the Sun Dome during high winds 16 stories above Boiling Brook. And he would tap dance for the commercial while a cameraman in a helicopter would film him for the stunt of the new commercial to release the new amusement park and shopping center. But even when the park opened on June 17th, construction was not done. It had many electrical wirings that was still exposed. Remember that, because that's gonna be foreshadowing for later in the video. And that's when local officials saw the situation. The mall owners were told they could not reopen until June 26th. So construction crews worked around the clock to complete the project. And after a last minute inspection, the mall opened on time to another crowd of 15,000 people and after the first month of operation the mall received over 50,000 visitors each weekend. So looking into the amusement park of old Chicago it featured three roller coasters. The Chicago Loop it was an aero roller coaster like the one at Knott's Berry Farm. It's actually an exact model of it and it was open the same year as the one at Knott's Berry Farm in 75. Aero would make four of these models one going to Knott's one at old Chicago and two others that were built around the country. Knott's Berry Farm's corks were opened a little earlier that's why it's considered the first ever inverting coaster. They also had a Chance Rides Toboggan and a ride called Chicago Cat, which was a Pinfari Zyklon Z47. Now, despite the amusement park being indoors, it was nothing more than an outside carnival. 
Ones that you just see down the road that just set up for a few days and then take off. For some other rides, the park featured a tilt-a-whirl, they featured a log ride, a zipper, a rotor, and some kiddie rides. And most of the games are stuff you see at common carnivals. They had a dunk tank, a guess your weight game, they even had a circus inside the amusement park. And in 1978, they created a ride called the Barnstormer. It was a first of its kind thrill ride in the amusement park, standing more than 70 feet high. The ride thrilled passengers with a giant fall falling dives and zooming climbs. Now looking at the mall as a whole, they featured lots of stores, but unfortunately none of these stores were really motivating people to come. They were not really the stores that encouraged repeat visitors. So most stores in Old Chicago, they would end up closing pretty soon, not even a few months in, which made Old Chicago kind of look like the first generation of a dying mall. But what was interesting about this mall, at each corner of Old Chicago, they actually had a concert or some people playing music while you were walking by. People would play folk, Dixieland, and most popular music each Saturday and Sunday. Other show attractions would include the classic comedy flicks, the Windy City Disco Movement, Punch, and Judy Going Show. These are actual names of bands in the 1970s in Chicago. So as time went on, and by that I mean just one month, problems of old Chicago would begin to set in. In July, a malfunctioning sprinkler system caused a six-hour shutdown of the mall. Later that year, a small fire in a trash compactor forced an evacuation of the mall. In November, an acrobat by the name of Jimmy Troy in the circus of the amusement park fell to his death from a trapeze at the circus. The mall was demanded to fix all these problems, and the problem was they didn't really have much money, and the investors for Robert Brindle, who owned the mall, weren't really happy for him at this time. So the investors of Illinois Central Railroad removed Brindle from management and installed a new guy called Clyde Farman, but we're not really going to hear much from him. So, Illinois Central took complete control of the mall's logistics in early 1977. They started rescheduling the hours of operation and spending over $8 million adding new attractions, a series of new management changes, but shops in the mall continued to close one by one. And once the novelty of the new mall wore off, the building didn't seem to attract many repeat visitors. And that is mainly because of competition. First of all, the mall is over 30 miles away from Chicago. And then in the heart of Chicago, they have something like Marshall Fields or Sears that simply just had a larger fan base. And if you didn't know what Marshall Fields is, it's this big warehouse that featured lots of retail shops everywhere and was one of the biggest retail stores in Chicago until it was turned into a Macy's. And then even the amusement park started to lose a lot of attendance, mainly because people weren't that interested with the rides anymore. A major factor for this was, in 1976, Marriott was building two parks in the country. They were building one in California and one right next to Chicago. Marriott's Great America, now known as Six Flags Great America, which had very similar rides to Old Chicago, they had turned of the century, which was later turned into Demon in 1980, which is really just an upgraded version of the Chicago Loop. So Old Chicago was, of course, old news now. So they really only had high attendance when there was like a big event like the 4th of July, which I have to mention, during one 4th of July show, the fireworks actually caught part of the roof to catch on fire, of course. Then there were two casualties that happened because of this. Now there's no information about a lawsuit or anything, but I imagine there was. So coming into 1978, Old Chicago had been closing Mondays and Tuesdays because they didn't have enough attendance or manpower to actually have them all operating these days. More fire struck during 1979. The Old Chicago Tobacco Company caught fire when a tobacco dryer malfunctioned. There were no sprinklers in the area where the fire started. Then finally in 1980, the whole amusement park, not the entire mall, just the amusement park got shut down. Most of the rides were sold, but only one of the coasters were ever purchased. The Chicago Loop was moved to Alabama State Fairgrounds. It was known as Corkscrew. Then it was located to Kenobi Lake Park as Kenobi Corkscrew, where it still operates today. Soon, the last of the stores closed afterwards. Management tried to pitch an idea of recreating the mall as a discount outlet. The plan didn't go through, and it didn't really attract many investors. So the mall finally closed in August of 1981. A group of investors purchased an enormous building shortly afterwards with plans to convert it into a casino. That didn't go through. The village of Boilingbrook nixed the idea of the building. Then it was put up for auction in 1982. Illinois Central Express, they just wanted to destroy the entire structure. But Boilingbrook had hoped they would find a buyer. 
They decided to alter the zoning laws in order to prevent the destruction, at least for a few more years anyway. As the area tried to find a new buyer, damage from roof leaks began to ruin the building even more. In addition, vandals repeatedly broke into the building, causing more damage and graffiti. In 1985, the building was finally sold to investment banker C.L. Carr, who initially pledged to keep the building open as an entertainment complex. He had ideas of making it an international trade center for the people Republic of China, and even had some ideas of building a Major League Baseball stadium for the Chicago White Sox. It failed, of course, and then it was up to no choice but to demolish the entire building in 1986. And then for 30 years, most of the site was sit there abandoned, but part of it was used for like a car dealership. Until eventually, on January 21st, 2020, Amazon paid $50.5 million to form the old Chicago Mega Mall site and are gonna use the 57 acres to potentially build a large Amazon warehouse. But that's pretty much the end of old Chicago. It failed because of competition, a lot of fire issues, and lack of public interest. Those are just some key points why this place failed. But don't be sad that old Chicago didn't last that long. It only lasted half a decade from 1975 to 1980. And the amusement park was definitely a first of its kind idea, but it did pave the way for new malls to want to build an amusement park to draw a bunch of visitors. Mall of America with Nickelodeon Universe, the West Edmonton Mall, opening not even a year after the fall of old Chicago, unveiling Galaxyland, but at the time it first opened, it was known as Fantasyland. Old Chicago was truly the start of something new. It's sad that the place shut down so soon, but if you want to see some old Chicago memorabilia, go to Kenobi Park to ride the original Chicago Loop where it still operates today. Thank you for watching this short little look of old Chicago. So leave in the comments below if you've experienced old Chicago when it was still around, or if you know someone who went here when they were little. This will be the first episode of a new series of Forgotten Amusement Parks. So if you liked the video, please leave that down below. And as always, please hit that subscribe button because it really does help the channel out. Watch more Grey American Coasters every week, and I'll see you all next time.